Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, we're gonna give a grand tour of belt grinders. Today, we are gonna be going over just kind of some basic stuff about how belt grinders work. So I've got with me uh, Jared Baker, old friend of mine, uh, who has recently purchased one of these, a, uh, an Ameribraid grinder. Uh, I've got two grinders. I've got a Bader and an Ameribraid, but since he's getting this one, and this is a pretty new type of design, I thought it might be handy to give him a little tour of it and give you guys a tour at the same time. So. Um, basically, I'm going to walk through all the uh, different attachments that are on here and kind of let Jared ask me questions as we go. So hopefully his questions will be useful to you. Well, first, let me just run through the basics of this machine. So you got a frame here uh, that the platen or the various attachments fit into. So those arms fit into here and then you just adjust this in and out, and we'll show that a little bit in a minute. The second uh, position here, there's an additional uh, setup here, so you can put all kinds of other attachments on here. The main one would be a table, but you can do a bunch of other stuff, including a uh, sharpening attachment that these guys just came out with. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff you could potentially put in the second little attachment area. This is your speed control. You can go forward or in reverse, start and stop, and then you've got variable speed. You can, you can buy these generally, almost all uh, belt grinders are also available in single speed, or maybe you just change out the little drive wheel and that'll change the speed. But the price of these little VFDs has come down over the last few years, and so you can buy VFDs for pretty reasonable amounts of money. If I were buying a machine today, 100%, I would get a speed control on it. Um, in fact, did Ameribraid even have a single speed version of it? I don't think they do. Okay. If you can get it, CNC. get it. Uh, back here is the motor. Um, usually you have a drive wheel attached to it. Some kinds of grinders, basically the drive wheel doubles as a uh, contact wheel. Like on the um, Grizzly, for instance, it's kind of right here and you can articulate the uh, platen. And so uh, if anybody wants to buy a, gri a Grizzly, that's the way that works. You have a contact wheel, which allows you to hollow grind, and then you have a platen that allows you to grind flat. Uh, so some work that way. This full drive wheel, and uh, attachment, and then this right up here is your tracking wheel. What that does is it moves the belt back and forth across the uh, face of the, of the platen or the wheel. All belts are a little bit different, so you have to be able to adjust that, otherwise they'll go flying off in all directions. Oh, one last thing I should mention, different grinders have different powers of motors. My recommendation is, you know, don't get anything less than a, uh, a horse and a half if you can avoid it. Um, that's what this is. Um, these guys, Ameribraid makes a horse and a half, two horse and three horse. The twos and the threes are 220, right? right. Yeah. So um, you have to do a little more wiring potentially if you're going to use the two or the three horse, but uh, you will never bog down a three horse motor. Uh, whereas if you really go after it on here, especially at higher speeds where the torque rolls off a little bit, you can bog this motor down. Uh, all right, so this right here is the first most important uh, attachment for most people, which is a flat platen. So the way that all the attachments on here work is basically you got two little wheels and then you just stick your attachments in here. You can put little tiny grinding wheels, big grinding wheels, um, slack belt setups. There's just all kinds of stuff that you can do on here. Um, I know you bought the um, master package, mastery package, right? right? Which has got a whole bunch of different um, attachments. So we can kind of go through all these different attachments and, you know, see how they work. All right, so to set it up, you just put the uh, 
belt on here. I've still got this, I haven't tightened this down. Well, I guess I did, but I didn't mean to. So I have it untightened here, and then I'll just pull it out until I've taken the slack out of it. There's a little latch under here that gives you room to maneuver with this thing. And then once you're ready to start grinding, you flick that latch and start grinding. That's handy because it means you don't have to hold this down the whole time while you're monkeying with the belt. Unlike, say, the baiter. The baiter, uh, you have to hold on to this and jockey with the, um, with the belt. Uh, the problem with this little latch is that you always forget to unhook it, and then when you turn the belt on, the belt's not tracking correctly and flies off. Uh, you get used to it after a while, and then you start doing it uh, every time, but the first few months that you have it, you'll forget it all the time, and the belt will fly off. That's just the way it is. Normally, the way that I start it is I put it in the forward position, I turn it to start, and I just sneak up on the uh, speed. And the reason for that is because every time that you change an attachment, you're always going to have uh, a different tracking situation. And so if you just put it on high speed and flick it on, you're liable to run the belt uh, off, the, off the platen one way or the other. So I like to start it down here and just sneak up. So I can adjust this. That's moving side to side. And uh, so I just put it so it's just barely hanging off of each side of the platen. And then I can crank it up to whatever speed I want. Flick the switch, back to zero. I've got this little latch down. I'll show you what happens if you turn this on uh, without disconnecting the little latch. It's now tracking way over here. Sometimes it'll try, oh, there we go. So you don't want that to happen. Quick note here, if you're enjoying my videos and want to support what I do, I hope you'll consider helping the channel out on Patreon. When you do, you'll get access to my library of plans. You know, I've been doing these videos for about 12 years now. So there are a lot of plans there for all kinds of builds that I've done over the years. And none of that has cost you a single penny. So if you feel like giving back, well, bless your souls. Link in the cards and description. So once again, you use these little wheels over here to tighten it up. Um, different grinders have different kinds of tables. In this case, uh, this has a little um, thing that allows you to articulate the uh, thing. You can set it to whatever angle you want to set it to, or you can just set it flat. And uh, this allows you to grind using jigs. So for instance, if I wanted to grind the outline of this blade, so this is kind of a K-bar-ish shape, Bowie-ish shape kind of thing. I could keep it flat on the table and just grind around the outlines of it. And then later on, if I'm using a jig, I'll put the jig in here and I'll use the jig to orient the blade so that it's always grinding at the exact same angle. So that is the table. While I have this on there, uh, I have a neat little attachment that I just got. This whole thing can be articulated to move around in different ways. You can put it over on the other side. You can flip it backwards. There are a bunch of different ways to do it. But the basic idea is that you have a knife that fits into this little gizmo here. Now you've got your knife at a particular angle and you just rest it on this little bar down here and grind this side, flip it over, grind that side. And the way that this is made, we were talking about, you were talking about these little shims here. Um, it's made so that you can orient the exact center of this to the center of the blade and that way you're going to grind both sides of the knife symmetrically.
but all that happens is you put it on this way, fire it up, run it like so, and then go the other direction. Now, normally if you're sharpening, you actually run the belt backwards. So the cool thing about this, uh, we were talking about this earlier, is you can hit this on reverse. Now the tracking kind of goes wonky. There's a different way of setting it. I'm not gonna get into that whole thing, but you can track it all backwards like this. Yeah, there we go. So anyway, as you can see, it's going up like this. So the, the logic of sharpening towards the edge as opposed to everything else that you do where you're grinding down toward it. Um, for one thing, when it gets super sharp, uh, it has a way of grabbing the belt so that the edge actually cuts into the belt and then you have this very sharp knife that's be getting hit by a belt that's flying at really fast speeds and it can fly off and hit you. But also, when you're, when you're grinding, I mean, when you're sharpening any knife, normally you want to sharpen towards the edge. So if this is the edge, you want to abrade this way so that you raise a little wire edge on the top. And with each successive sharpening and at higher grits, you're taking off little pieces of that burr until there's ultimately, hopefully, nothing left of that burr and it'll be nice and sharp. So, works better to sharpen running up than running down towards the, right. the knife. Have you sharpened uh, many knives? Or any? I literally got this just yesterday, so um, it is uh, a work in progress, but I've, I've sharpened two or three knives and it really, it was great. Basically what I did is I started out with um, a fairly heavy grit belt. This is a 120 grit um, ceramic belt, sharpened with that. And then I went ultimately up to this structured abrasive belt here. This is a, um, a Sun Max, uh, which I got from uh, Combat Abrasives. And I find these are great for sharpening. So this is a 45 micron belt, which is a very fine abrasive. That's, I don't know, like 1200 grit or something. I mean, something in that range. And it's pretty soft and forgiving. So as this thing's running up there, you're sharpening on there and you can get really a, quite a good edge with, with something like this. Everybody's gonna have their own way of doing it, but that, that belt really works for me. Uh, with, uh, with this new kit. So uh, the deal is that um, basically there are a bunch of different things that you can do. There's a little set screw in here so you can raise and lower this so you could, you know, have this at different angles and the, the further down on the platen that you are, the uh, more, what is that, obtuse that the angle is going to be. The higher up it is, the more acute it is. So you can adjust it that way. But the main way is just that you're gonna, um, you can take this in and out, and then you can also take this and move it that way. So between those, you know, basically you have three points of adjustment here, here, uh, and um, the distance here. So any one of those will you know, help you adjust the angle. As far as, you know, what exactly that angle is, everybody's got their own angles, 15 degrees or whatever it is. And, it, you know, if you wanted to measure all this with a angle finder or something like that, you could. Or you, if you have an existing angle that you happen to like on a particular um, knife, you can come in here and, you know, kind of just eyeball it until you get the angle that you're looking for, and then you just duplicate that angle over and over. You know, I haven't used this extensively, but so far I like this a lot, and I was able to get really quite good uh, sharpness with it. So, that's great. What would you suggest doing to sharpen if you didn't have this? If you wanted to use this to sharpen without that? Um, so the way I did it prior to yesterday um, is basically the same idea. I'm running the uh, platen backwards. I go 
120 grit belt until I get to the edge. Then I'll go up maybe to 220 or maybe I'll just skip right on up to structured abrasives. Once I get to structured abrasives, um, you know, it's just a question of which one I want to stop on. Typically I'll do it to the 45 micron, um, but there's no magic formula for that. And all I'm just doing is uh, eyeballing it. What I'm hoping I'll be able to eliminate here is that the next step is that I go over to my bench grinder and I've got a little um, stropping type of attachment, whatever you want to call it, um, that you use um, Jewelers Rouge and uh, you know you can get a real fine edge with it but it's kind of a pain in the neck and you got to clean all that rouge off so I'm hoping that once I get this dialed in I'm going to be able to just use this and not have to go to that last little step of polishing the edge. You get a 72 inch strop. That's true and I got a cork belt so I'm going to try that too. Um, you know a whole bunch of options. So let me ask another question. How would you set up the grinder for, for an angle if you weren't sharpening by hand and you were needing to use a jig or okay so how, how would you go about setting up to, to sharpen without to sharpen with this yeah. oh just eyeball I mean honestly you know normally I just eyeball it because you know if you're making a camp knife one time and you're making a, a EDC type knife or something, a tactical knife, the thickness of the knife is going to be different. The purpose of the knife, you know, especially kitchen knives, paring knives and stuff like that, they may be super thin on the edge. And so if I were doing a paring knife, I would want to have a much um, more acute angle than if I were doing a camp knife where you're just going to be chopping on it and batoning it and beating the crap out of it. So in that case, you would have a much heavier angle. But I've just made so many knives, I know roughly how I want to hold it, and I just do it that way by eyeball, cool. which is, you know, not really a useful answer necessarily. But <laughs> that's how I would do it. Uh, all right, so um, let's move on to another attachment here. Okay, so now I'm going to take a quick second to jump over to the baiter. What I'm trying to do here is not just talk about the Ameribraid. Uh, there are a lot of good grinders out there. This old baiter has lasted me over 20 years. Um, and uh, the basic construction is very, very similar to the uh, Ameribraid. You know, you got a motor, you got a drive wheel, tracking, uh, and an attachment arm that fits into the shoe right here. So the differences are essentially differences in uh, detail rather than the basic idea of the grinder. There are some other grinders that have quite different designs, but what I'm trying to do with this is just give you a general flavor of all the sorts of things that are out there. So what I'm going to show here is the slack belt fixture. So anyway, there it is. So now we got it all set up. The reason this is called a slack belt attachment is because this is, has no hard backing to it. And as a result, the harder you push into it, the more of a rounded sort of effect that you're going to get on whatever you're grinding. The purpose of slack belt fixtures is to produce a really smooth radius grind that can be used to produce a convex grind but it also is commonly used for finishing handles and that sort of thing so that um, by allowing the belt to sort of move both this way and this way you know and rotating all it it'll track the pro the contours of a handle and give you the ability to make lots of smooth transitions. So slack belt fixtures, extremely useful for finishing knife handles, but also if you're doing convex grinds, very handy for that. So in terms of basic grinding, probably the second most popular method of grinding is hollow grinding. Um, so you would typically do that on a big wheel like this. sets up exactly the same way. 
push it in, pull it back out until you got the slack taken out of it. Tighten these up. Always remember to pull the latch. And now it's going to have enough tautness on there to hold it in the position you want. So I always just spin it and, um, you know, track it roughly just manually. And that way it's not going to fly off or run in there and t trash your belt. So, so just to show you how that would work, uh, you're just grinding your edge right along here. Again, you could put a, um, you could put the little table in here. You could put a grinding jig on there, uh, elevate that or move it at some angle, you know, whatever makes sense for whatever you're, uh, for whatever you're grinding. So in this case, with a flat flatten, you're going to have a completely flat grind. And in the case of a hollow grind, it dips in, as the name suggests. But the basic techniques of grinding these things is pretty much the same, you know. All right, so next. Ugh. What I'll show is really a, a super useful uh, attachment. So basically, this grinder has a sort of multi-size uh, small wheel attachment so that there are all these different size wheels that fit in here and you can produce different radii uh, with different sizes of um, small wheels. One of the things that you learn as you start grinding stuff is that um, if you can use the you know surface of any wheel on your grinder to impose some particular really regular shape into your knife, it makes them look more professional. And so by having all these different sizes of, um, of wheels, you can impose different, you know, just to give an example, this little radius right here is exactly that. It's an inch and a quarter radius. I just happen to know that because I grind these all the time. This in here, uh, the smallest interior radius right here is about a half inch radius. And so, you know, if I want to grind that, I can swap these little uh, wheels out and this will fit in here and then this one will fit there. And that's incredibly handy. It seems to me that you would want to use the biggest contact wheel you could for the radius you're trying to. Well, what you want is to actually have the exact radius. So it's not a matter of bigger or smaller. It's just a matter of exactly pegging whatever the radius that you want is. Okay. Same deal. I pull the slack out of it. Take that off. And then I run it through by hand. It has a way of smacking into the sides on this particular one. This one tends to track a little bit differently from everything else. So again, I want to run it through there fairly slowly, make sure that it's tracking where I want it, and then I can increase the speed. Now, with little bitty wheels like this, you don't want to run these super fast. If you run these at, you know, 100%, which is 5,200 feet per second or something like that, you're turning these bearings extremely fast, and you'll heat them up and burn them out eventually but most of the time you're not using this to do incredibly it's it's a it's a small amount of grinding you're doing at a time so uh, you don't need to be running it at max speed when you're when you're using these at least most of the time this attachment right here duplicates what is done over on the Ameribraid but in a slightly different way so the idea here is that Basically, you only have on this particular arm one wheel. 
So in this case, I've got a one inch wheel. This wheel is rubber, which I prefer over the metal uh, wheels of the Meribraid. Of course, rubber's more expensive, and that's probably the main reason. This only has one attachment. You've got about seven wheels over there. The, the basic idea is exactly the same. In this case, you can uh, use a, an Allen key to uh, open this and pull this off. And uh, Bader makes a whole bunch of different sizes of small wheels, just like a Meribraid, but you have to replace this entire attachment. Um, incidentally, you know, the bearings do burn out on these things, so you just have to pull this off and you can buy replacement, just the wheel part, and then replace that as needed. Now, you don't burn them out all the time, but it's just something to be aware of. Over time, these bearings will go on you. Uh, but the basic idea here, exactly the same as with the Ameribraid. Fits on there. And you can grind away on radiuses. So my general point here is that, you know, there are a ton of different uh, grinders out there. So you should always be looking for the one that is most uh, suited to your budget and to the kind of knives that you make. These subtle little differences in how they operate um, could potentially be a big difference to you in the kind of knives that you make. Uh, I am not the world's biggest fan of rotary platens, but here's the idea of the rotary platen. So what a rotary platen allows you to do is to have a flat platen, but to back it with something fairly soft. So you have this rubber belt that's on here, and that cushions the belt as it runs over the face. When you're grinding with a big, uh, heavy grit ceramic belt, like a 36 grit belt, you can just blast away and it's very stable. Every inch of it feels the same. Now, right here, you have a little joint. On uh, heavy grit belts, that joint is not all that perceptible because the grit hangs way off the belt. But the finer that the abrasive is, there's a little piece of tape that actually attaches those pieces of the, of the um, belt together. And that tape actually causes it bunk, bunk, bunk. Every time it passes over the platen, right. it creates what's called belt bump. Belt bump is terrible. It really throws off your grinds and it actually creates a perceptible visual mark on the, uh, on your grind. You want to avoid it. Uh, the rotary platen is a good way to do that. So you can run up on rotary platens up into higher grits. Typically the cutoff is around 220. After you get much above 220, things start bumping like crazy on a flat platen. But uh, you can put the rotary platen on there. It's nice and smooth. There are other advantages and disadvantages to them. You know, you can kind of roll the edges over a little bit. Some people like them for all kinds of stuff. Um, they, they tend to heat up. They smell like rubber. Um, there are a bunch of reasons to not like rotary platens, but the main thing that I don't like is that they're not quite as predictable as a flat platen, and the belt tends to sort of roll a little bit on them, and so it's harder, at least for me, to get a completely flat, predictable grind off of them. Other people love them. One of the things that you learn with using these things, everybody has different things that they like, Everybody's making different kinds of knives. Your techniques vary, and something that works great for you might not work worth crap for somebody else and vice versa. So some people love these. I'm just not one of them. Okay, so this is a um, surface grinding attachment. This is by far the most expensive attachment that's available for this, uh, for this model. As you look at it, it's for good reasons. It's very complicated. Uh, but the basic idea is, over there I have another machine that's a surface grinder. The idea of a surface grinder is that you use a rotary 
uh, grinding attachment of some sort to move over a flat surface. And if you can do that in a really um, stable way, you can grind extremely flat surfaces that way. And that's what this surface grinder does. It doesn't do it as cleanly as you know, a dedicated surface grinder, um, but the advantage is it goes way faster than dedicated surface grinders do. So uh, this introduces yet one more feature of this grinder that is extremely cool. Um, and there are other grinders that, that have this kind of feature, but um, it's, it's very handy. So there's a little wheel here that allows you to move this like so. So again, you set it up more or less the same way. You just pull this out until you take the slack out of it. Tighten it up. So uh, now let me sit this in the position that you would normally put it. So normally what you do is you take a piece of stock and it's got little magnet doodads here. You put the stock on here, turn these little magnets and it uses this magnetic chuck to hold the knife or piece of stock or whatever to this platen. And you can now move this back and forth and hopefully not stab yourself with your knife. Basically by just running this uh, small wheel over the top of this piece of stock, you can flatten it out. So there are a number of cool things that you can do with, uh, with these attachments. You can taper tangs. You can take scale off of uh, stock, you know, mill stock, um, just to flatten out a knife before you do something with it. Um, and the thing, you know, as I was saying to you, the thing that I would use this by far the most for is to grind the scale off of billets that I'm forging for Damascus. Damascus, by far the most useful thing for me for this. Uh, if you're if you come out of the machine tool world and you know you think about surface grinders, they grind to tenths, uh, ten thousandths of an inch, uh, and they're extremely precise tools. That's not what this is for. This is just to get stuff quick and dirty, flat enough, um, and it's really nice for taking the scale off of stuff and just you know like we were talking about earlier, if you have a piece of stock, like, you know, this piece of stock right here is, uh, has got a scale on it. It's pretty flat, but it's not totally flat. It's been sheared, and so on these edges, it kind of rolls over a little bit. So we can take all of that off here by, flat, you know, sticking it on the chuck, grinding it off. And for that, it's a terrific tool. Um, as Jared and I were discussing, this is probably not something that a beginning knife maker, if they're just first starting out and just buying a, a grinder, this is probably not a tool that you need to get right out of the box, unless I had a ton of money. <laughs> if you got a ton of money, buy everything. All right, well, I think we've kind of run through most of the basic stuff, and of course, I, I'm, I'm sitting here, uh, you know, talking to Jared like he doesn't know anything about these. He's actually done a lot of research on it, and. Um, so uh, he knows the answers to a lot of these questions already, but uh, I'm gonna ask Jared a bunch of questions, or uh, let Jared ask me some questions and kind of answer those as we go. So <clears throat> anything strikes you right off the bat? Um, well, I'm most interested in uh, being able to do perimeter grinding uh, with it in a horizontal position. Okay, glad you mentioned that. That is something that I never do, and so let's experiment together here. So uh, what Jared is asking, you know, normally when you make a knife, uh, the first thing that you do is to make it shaped like a knife. So that's grinding the outline, perimeter grinding, whatever you want to call it, uh, but you're, you're making the most basic shape of the knife. And so uh, you can do that this way or you can put the table here and grind it this way, but 
as you're suggesting, you can also go uh, horizontally, turn it like this. And so in that case, you're gonna put the table in here. So now you can put it on top of here and grind it that way. And this table can be raised and lowered this way. So as you can see, this is milled out right here. So, so the, I, I've set it up to run it so that my um, platen is in here and I'm grinding vertically. But if you set it up this way, this way, yeah, see, so now we can do it like this and you can raise, raise and lower the table with this little milled slot here. So then I'd raise this up so that it's right in front of the, um, of the platen there. So now, ta-da, you can put it on there, tighten this up, and grind long ways on here. Like I said, I absolutely never do it that way, but that's how you would do it. How do you normally do it? So uh, let's go back to the vertical position. Move that back to there. So that would be the normal position for me when I'm profile grinding. So if I were grinding here, I'm grinding like this. The advantage of going horizontally is that you can run the whole thing in there and particularly if you're trying to grind a big flat piece or you wanna have a very gentle curve, uh, you've got that whole surface that you can work with. The advantage of working this way is you can work the corners. And why would you wanna do that? The reason is that digging into these corners is the fastest way. If you just wanna blitzkrieg through here and get rid of material, just <laughs> pushing it into those corners is the fast way, fastest way to take off material. Let me just see if I can do that here. Obviously, you do not wanna grind without glasses. So what I'm doing is I'm hanging this side of the belt just the tiniest bit off of the edge. That's pretty fast. <laughs> it's not, it's not a, a pretty way of doing things. If you're trying to get a nice smooth curve or anything, this is a terrible way of doing it. But if you're just, you know, you gotta get rid of this part and that part. So they're all this, these parts that you just wanna remove material as fast as humanly possible and hanging it off the corners is the way I usually do that. Other questions? Probably millions. <laughs> All right, good enough. Well, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up there. I uh, wanna thank Jared for uh, putting up with my silly video here. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Thanks for having me. All right, see you later, guys. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years, so I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com